I'm delighted to welcome Elizabeth Cousins. Great to be here, Ian. Uh, such a range of things to talk about. I want to start big picture, which is, of course, uh, we are not seeing 8 billion people on the planet progressing the way we need to. Uh, a global middle class is hollowing out. Um, uh, poverty is increasing. Do you think this is a new condition that people in the world have to get used to, that we're not going to be seeing inexorable progress going forward? Yeah, so is it our new normal to go backwards instead of forwards? Uh, no, I don't think it's inevitable at all, but we are in not the best place. And look, we were behind even before the pandemic, even before mm -hmm. war in Ukraine, and even before the last three additional years of climate impacts, which have been so punishing. So it's no secret that we have lost ground in those three years. Um, we've had poverty rising again, extreme poverty, which you just noticed, um, and so many other development indicators that have gone backwards rather than forwards. Um, you know, inequality is rising, too many indicators to count, but that doesn't mean it's inevitable at all. Um, so I think the real challenge for all of us is how do we get back on track? How do we regain lost ground? And how do we renew our uh, our commitment to, to creating a better world? And we have all of the means at our disposals to do that. We just have some politics that, uh, in my view, are interfering. When you say the politics are not cooperating, what, what, are your, what are the top things that you're talking about in that regard? No, I think it's politics, frankly, at every level. Uh, so first, it's the challenge of politics in countries, whether it's wealthy donor, donor countries or others who are, you know, have turned inward more or less in the last few years. And that's led to, you know, de uh, depressed levels of overseas development assistance um, and, and other investments. We've seen, obviously, the war in Ukraine have a, a real uh, shaping effect on, on, on European donors. Um, but the larger question, to my mind, is is whether we see collectively that we are we are on one planet, we're in one world, we have uh, fates that are intertwined, and whether we have a commitment to do something about that with a kind of spirit of common humanity. We've lost ground on that front, and we see that here at home in the United States, we see it in other places around the world. But that to me is really the challenge of our times to figure out and to re-galvanize re that spirit of, of we're in it together, we have more in common than we have that divides us, and we can't solve any problem on the global agenda that we see today without uh, intensified global cooperation. So that really is, to my mind, the, the challenge of our times. Think about climate change and what the future economy, a climate-friendly economy, looks like. Part of the question is about time frame. Some of it's about how markets are structured. A lot of it's about the policy signals to get the capital that they're is plenty of in the world directed at the right kinds of things. So that is a political problem. It's a policy challenge. It's one so far we're starting to solve, but insufficiently solving, and we just need to accelerate uh, our efforts to do that. If I were to put in front of you right now um, the imminence of the food and fertilizer crisis, the imminence of global inflation, and, and sort of push and pull that against climate and what's happening every single year and the costs are only getting greater. Um, is it an inexorable reality that we've just lost an ine enormous amount of time and momentum because the former is distracting from the latter or are they actually moving together? Well, two things. First, overall, we have to get better at dealing with simultaneous crises. We obviously face several right now that are global in nature, systemic in their impacts. It started with the pandemic. Every year it includes climate and the food and hunger crisis is obviously galloping along with us, um, commanding less attention, I think, uh, still than it should. Um, so we have to get better at dealing with simultaneous crises one way or the other. And understanding what the interaction effects are between them. So there are some crises that drive others. There are some trade-offs, but we we just have to get better at that. But there's both a bandwidth question and also a resource uh, challenge. But you don't fix the food and hunger crisis that we have this year or in future years unless you fix the climate emergency. So you have to do both. They're absolutely intertwined. I was recently with uh, Chef uh, Jose Andres, um, who was about as dire as I have seen a human being be in front of me in expectations for massive expansion of starvation um, unless enormous amounts of funds are directed immediately uh, towards food aid, critical food aid. Um, I know this is it's what he focuses on and he's deeply committed to it, but um, was he overstating the case? 
No, not remotely. I mean, I I have to say, I spent the last week uh, in Davos, as I think you and others did. I was struck that compared to just several months ago, when this was top of the agenda, it didn't feature. It did not remotely. It did not. Uh, actually, it's only getting worse. And, you know, there's a seasonality to food and hunger crises because they depend on food yields and they depend on uh, on on, you know, when crops are produced and when 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 fields are fallow. So we are going to see this get so much worse uh, over the course of this year. And I don't think we're paying collectively the right kind of uh, emergency attention to it that we need to. We will uh, in the moment, but we need to be doing it now. So I I, I, I fear he's right. What might that look like? We have done heroic things before on the humanitarian front. It's not like we're not collectively capable of it. So it need, I mean, this needs a, a true mobilization of effort. Some of it's about financing. Some of it's about making sure that we're working directly with communities who are the most vulnerable and likely to be affected. I mean, you do see the UN already doing what it can so far under its current conditions, trying to negotiate, um, you know, the the um, negotiate food supplies um, and fertilizer from uh, from. Ukraine and Russia. That's a really important piece of their uh, diplomatic effort. But the humanitarian scale of this emergency is, is enormous, and we just have to treat it as such. The needs are huge and growing, and we have to be able to rise to this challenge and see it as something that's in both our interests and, you know, uh, in our, you know, in our sense of common humanity. We can't. We're not confronted at the moment with the images. We're not confronted with the reality that so many people around the world are facing. But that is coming. And we will wish we had done more earlier. I wonder, um, as the world moves towards China becoming the largest economy uh, by the end of this decade in all likelihood, but China also being a middle-income country, a poor country, not a country that historically has done a lot um, in terms of leadership when we talk about humanitarian aid around the world, are you feeling that geopolitical reality as more of a constraint in terms of humanitarian support. Yeah, well, look, I, I hope that the geopolitical uh, realities, which are fierce in a lot of different dimensions, actually create opportunities for global leadership. Um, you've certainly seen um, China increase its contribution to the UN for all things from the regular budget to peacekeeping. I hope that may also be true in humanitarian terms. I think you know, th this has to be seen as, as a global effort, which really does require all of us to step up for our fellow human beings who are in grave need. We, we've talked mostly about government support so far. Um, of course, your approach is a multi-stakeholder approach. You've had a lot to say about philanthropy. And I'm wondering how you think philanthropy, what role it is playing right now from the private sector, from the foundation environment, um, and, and whether or not that is also evolving to meet the needs. I think we have seen the role of philanthropy, big and small, and let's recognize that philanthropy is a very diverse set of actors in all geographies at all, all scales and levels. But we have seen both traditional philanthropies and new philanthropies really step up increasingly to recognize you know, the gravity of the challenges we face, their unique role in their respective societies and communities, both with their money and with their voice and with their ability sometimes to provide a novel platform for innovation and different kinds of solutions. Um, that's something that we at the UN Foundation have tried to be. And you see that with, with um, so many philanthropies around the world. Those who came together around COVID, there was a global alliance of philanthropies that came together to, do, to support COVID response. You've seen that around the energy transition. Uh, you see it around climate in particular. And I think there is a real prospect also around this food and hunger crisis, um, working very much with other sectors, not just philanthropies, but it's everyone that they can bring to bear and, and ways that they can contribute um, meaningfully. I, you know, I think we see the deficit of trust in so many institutions these days, and that does create the possibility for others to step into that breach and to recognize that you know, we all have different kinds of roles that we can play, and it's important that we play them as ambitiously and fully as possible. Now, um, I, I noticed that um, the Gates Foundation recently announced that they're moving from six billion to nine billion of allocated uh, funding a year in today's environment. Now, they've been quite notable in the sense that they've said cons consistently they want to spend all their money. Like they don't want to create a foundation that's going to live forever. I mean, governments, of course. 
um, tend to spend much more uh, than the money that they actually have, though not, uh, not always uh, on the smartest things. Foundations tend to be much, much more cautious and conservative. Um, does that need to change? And is that changing if it does? Well, I think it's already changing. I mean, it, it's true that foundations historically have tended to have um, to be conservative because they want to retain their philanthropic capital so they can use it in a perpetual basis. But what I think you're seeing from quite a lot of philanthropies, and you're seeing it from the business sector as well, is a recognition that we have a window right now. This is this is a moment in time where the choices we make, the investments we make, have such long-term consequence. And so you're seeing a great freeing up, I think, from certainly a lot of the philanthropies we work with um, to want to use their capital, again, use their voice and use their influence in different ways to, to, to contribute to the sort of changes that are needed in real time. We don't have 20 or 40 or 50 years to wait to deal with the climate crisis. We have to do it in the next five to 10. You know, the people we were talking about who are who are hungry at the beginning of this call, they're hungry now. They're not hungry 10 years from now. So there's a, a time sensitivity to action that I think you're seeing an increasing recognition of. To me, that is that has a lot of possibility in it. We, of course, have to make best use of it. But but I do think you're seeing that kind of thing change quite a lot. I mean, it really needs to. When I think about climate in particular, it is so obvious that the Dam the damage and the dangers in the world today have been overwhelmingly caused by the wealthiest countries in the world. Um, and it's not the fault of an India or an Indonesia or Pakistan that they're facing the challenges that they are right now. And yet these wealthy governments are fund and, and the corporations that have done so well inside them uh, uh, just do not seem to take any direct accountability or responsibility um, for, for being stewards. Um, for for actually you know being responsible for the position that we're presently in, and I know this frustrates the United Nations greatly. Yeah, look, I think there's a lot of collective responsibility to go around because the world's not in an optimal place, and we variously all contributed to that. Um, I think there is a real um, a real reckoning of a sort to, to come as people are increasingly recognizing their contribution to the state of the world that is not particularly healthy. And then the question is, what are you going to do about it? So I, I do see growing appreciation, increasing candor and self-reflection, frankly, from big institutions, from powerful and influential institutions, not enough and not fast enough. But I do think that's trending in the right direction because, you know, sometimes that comes from people's own kids, kids who are questioning <laughs> How you know what kind of world are you going to leave us with? This is these are these are very deep issues, not just at a professional or an institutional level, but very much at a personal one. And I think we need to see that sort of recognition grow, deepen, and then inspire some real changes in behavior. It's funny you just ended with that because it, it was what I was going to ask you about because we do see, I mean, in among the advanced industrial economies, it is the young people that recognize. Um, that uh, the planet that they're going to be growing up in is not one that they're they're proud of of having inherited. Uh, when we talk about some of these big structural developments, what is your foundation doing to try to better engage the voices, the participation, and capture, harness the energy of those young people? Well, let me tell you how I started my morning this morning. So I started my morning by hosting a call with the world's leading youth-focused and youth-led organizations who represent roughly 875 million young people around the world. They have all come together in something called the Unlock the Future Coalition. That's something we've supported from the beginning to exert influence on the global stage, to align around things that they want to see happen and mobilize their collective energy and influence in, in a powerful way. So that's one of the things we're doing. I think anybody who can contribute to putting power, resources, voice uh, underneath young people who are already exercising incredible leadership in their communities around the world, often at great risk to themselves, is all going to be for the better. And it's, you know, it's their world. I mean, I, I keep thinking of that that saying that you don't inherit the world from your ancestors, you borrow it from your children. I mean, that couldn't be truer now uh, than at any time in the past. So I think that sensibility of what we're bequeathing to younger generations and not just the young people who make up half of the world's population today, but the 11 billion people who are yet to be born by the end of this century, what are we leaving to them? So I think anything we can do to heighten our 
appreciation for that responsibility and and to think you know really searchingly about what we can each do and some people can do very small things some people can do huge things anything you can do is worth is worth it because this really will take all of us to make the kinds of transitions that are required in our economies in our industries uh, in our politics to be able to move into the 21st century and 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 anticipate that it will be a better fairer and healthier place so I want to end on an optimistic note. Tell the audience something that you are working on right now, specifically or broadly, uh, where the global response is actually surprising you on the upside. I think there are great surprises. And of course, smallpox eradication is a great one from history that is also an incredible achievement, also at a time of great geopolitical competition. But let me rem remind you know, uh, colleagues who are listening in the last year, last year was a, a tough year, but three big things got done last year, an agreement by all countries that they're going to negotiate a comprehensive treaty on plastics in the ocean, an agreement to negotiate a treaty on pandemic preparedness and response. And at the end of the year, and something we are involved in with so many others, a landmark agreement on biodiversity to try to halt and reverse biodiversity loss on this planet by 2030. Um, some of that comes under the term 30 by 30 to preserve 30% of the world's land and seas by 2030. But I think you know the statistics, the extraordinary toll on biodiversity and species loss that there has been uh, um, that we're facing. And, and there is incredible opportunity to band together, I think, especially on the basis of this agreement that was unexpectedly reached at the end of last year by all countries to try to do something about it. Elizabeth Cousins, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, and great to be with you.